All right, welcome back for video two. So right here, we're looking at the main menu for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. You can see you can go to England, Norway, Ireland, France, but then there's Vinland. What is Vinland? So Vinland is this mythological place that most people believe is Newfoundland in North America. Some people pronounce it Newfoundland. I'm not sure which is correct, but this isn't necessarily something that is accurate in the video game, but it's long been believed and there's more and more evidence that's been discovered in recent years showing that the Vikings were here before Columbus. I mentioned this in the first video, but it's very important because in the game it's kind of cool. They associate the Vikings with arriving in Vinland, is what they call it, which most people believe again is Newfoundland. And you can see here there's Native American anglicized words and you'll see some characters that have Native American type attire. So this is a prominent part of the game which is pretty educational but also pretty fun. I must take my leave. So long. So the Vikings have quite a bit of information associated with them. First, the Viking attacks took place mostly in the 9th and 10th centuries, which is 900 AD. There's a lack of arable land. Now you should know that word arable from back in ancient Greece. It means there's not very much farmland. So this leads to the Vikings exploring. They have a polytheistic religion. They eventually converted to Christianity. Now most of you know Thor from the Marvel, you know, cinematic movies, etc. So Thor, Odin, all of those are the polytheistic gods in Norse mythology. Vikings settled in areas known today as Russia, Iceland, Greenland, briefly North America. They also have chieftains. These are tribal units and the chieftains are their leaders, just like the other invader groups. Their invasions disrupted trade, towns declined. The Viking attacks also caused the collapse of the Frankish Empire, founded by Charlemagne. They're also famous for their sea and river trade in Eastern Europe, but as you can see here in the video game Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I'm in Scandinavia. This is where the Vikings come from. And you can see the landscape is totally different from that of Northern Europe. Icy, cold, they have the longhouse right there, mountains everywhere. So they are sea raiders. That's really what the word Viking translates to. The longboat is their main ship, and it uses sails, but also uses paddles or oars. It doesn't have a below decks area for protection, but these are very shallow draft ships, meaning they can go up into rivers, and this becomes an important part of their invasions in England. Now contrast the landscape from Scandinavia to here, this is England. You can see this is better for farmland. There's more area for farms, growing crops, etc. 
there are mountains, but not as harsh, and it's not frozen. You can't really grow crops in frozen you know, ground. It's hard enough to dig. So this is why the Vikings ventured out. They needed to explore because they wanted to be able to grow crops. And I know all the legends show about what great warriors they were, and they were. They were definitely wonderful fighters, you know, all the legends about them is accurate. However, most of them were farmers and traders as more and more information is becoming available due to archeological discoveries, etc. So this brings us to a big vocabulary word you really need to know, and people struggle with this. It's called feudalism. The decline of Roman influence in Western Europe left people with little protection against invasion, so they entered into feudal agreements with landholding lords who promised them protection. Remember, the idea behind feudalism is that everyone gives something and everyone gets something. For example, a king owns land and he gives land to others who then give the king military service and protection. A lord receives land from the king, but he gives taxes and military service to the king. A knight receives land from a lord and gives military service to the lord. And then finally at the bottom you have serfs, which we'll talk about now. So this is one of the areas that gives students most difficulty. This is your feudal organizational chart, or the way their class system is set up. At the top you have the king represented by the crown. He has lords below him who he gives land to. So for example, you get the titles like Duke and Duchess, Baron, Baroness, etc. And below them they have knights who fight. And then at the bottom you have serfs. They're the little blue people who are afraid of Gargamel. Nah, I'm kidding. They're kind of like slaves, but they're not. They can't be bought and sold. They're tied to the land. Generally what serfs are is they agree to work not for money, but for protection. So think about if you watched the TV show The Walking Dead. There was a point where they go to the prison for protection and everybody's working. They're growing food, they're cleaning up the prison, they're looking out for each other, but no one's getting paid. Why? Because they do it because they need to. They have to in order to survive. So the serfs are not worried about getting money. They just want to have a place to sleep, they want to have food, and they want to have protection. That's what feudalism does, is everyone is contributing for the benefit of each other. So again, if you look at the right-hand side of the chart, the king gives lands. The land is called a fief, and he gives a title to the lord. The lord receives land and a title from the king. The knight receives land from the lords, and the serfs receive protection from the knights. Now you go over to the left side, serfs give labor to the knights. They work, they grow the food that everyone needs. Knights give military service to the lords, and the lords give taxes to the king. The king or monarch receives taxes and protection from the lords. So everyone is helping each other for the better of all. So the key vocabulary here, first and foremost, fief. It's a weird word, we don't use it today, so that makes it difficult. It's a plot of land. In the feudal system, kings give fiefs to lords in exchange for protection. Now, here's another one we don't use today, a vassal. This is someone who receives land, or someone who receives a fief in exchange for their loyalty. So a lord who receives a fief from the king is a vassal to the king. I know that's complicated, but that's how it works. From my experience, vassal is probably the most missed word for students. It's just difficult to comprehend. But if you receive a fief or land, that makes you a vassal to the person who gave it to you. Next, as we already mentioned, we have serfs. They're peasants who are tied to the land. They work in exchange for protection. They don't get paid. They get food, they get protection, and a safe place in case of an invasion. So at the bottom, you have feudal obligations. When a vassal receives land, they're obligated to pay taxes and perform military service. The manorial system, and again, this is confusing because you have feudalism, and then you also have the word manorial system, which comes from the word manor. It's the same thing. 
so it's kind of confusing. And what a manor is, you'll see in a moment. But the manorial system is the same as feudalism. Within the manorial system, you have a rigid class structure. It's not flexible. You're stuck in the class you're born in. There's also self-sufficient manners. Because of invasions, trade is dangerous. Manners become self-sufficient. They produce everything you need. No one wants to leave to go trade with another town. So therefore, if there's something you need, you figure out how to make it. That's what keeps you safe. And the Crazy Duck has some advice. Remember, most people think of castles when they think of the Middle Ages. However, a manor house is in some ways like a castle, but on a smaller scale. It's made of stone, so if Vikings or Magyars or Angles or Saxons invade a manor, the actual manor house, because it's made of stone, provides better protection for the serfs, the lords, even the knights if needed. This last image is very important. It depicts the manorial system during the Middle Ages. This would be an example of a self-sufficient manor. So if you look, it has a manor house in the background. It's made of stone. It would provide protection. There's a small river or creek. It has a mill, which provides power for grinding grain, etc. There's a church. There's fields for farming. There's open areas for people to have little stores and shops. Everyone provides everything that they need because once again, they're afraid to leave this area for fear of being attacked by invaders, including the Vikings, Magyars, Angles, and Saxons. The main thing about this image is from my experience, there's usually a picture on a CSA or SOL or other type of standardized test showing you something like a manor house or a castle along with planting fields. And they want you to get the idea that it's a self-sufficient manor. Okay, so this is just to review the maps. So the area I'm circling, that's Scandinavia. That's where the Vikings are from. So if you need to look around, look for the Italian peninsula, look for the crazy duck, the Nike tennis shoe. So the Vikings are going to England, which is an island above France. Next, we have the Angles and the Saxons. So I'm circling where they're both from. And again, they're going to England. Again, the word Angles and Saxons, that's where we get the term Anglo-Saxons, people of Angles and Saxons descent that are in England today. And finally, the Magyars. This is the one most people have the hardest time. They're from Central Asia, and they migrate into Central Europe. So please make sure, if you have any issues, because this is something that most students struggle with because of the vocabulary, words like beef and vassals, feudalism, manorial system, it is complicated, it's kind of annoying, but again, the more you use the words, the easier it is to deal with. So again, watch the video as many times as you want to until you become comfortable, and I'm definitely going to be doing a CSA review for your third nine weeks standardized test. So we'll review it again and you'll be fine. Just again, watch as many times as you need to. The more repetition you have, the more comfortable it becomes.